On this program today, we'll be talking to John Burke, who's a geophysical investigator. He's going to be talking to us about the science behind sacred sites, crop circles, the ancient monuments, and what it is that makes them special, magical, and particularly sensitive to human consciousness. Thank you, John, for being here. Thanks for having me. You've taken instruments, you've measured what it is that makes something a sacred site. I actually don't use the word sacred for that reason. So I believe that in most of these cases, it was a very physical purpose and a very physical action that occurred there, more so than a spiritual one. But uh, They are meaning places like Stonehenge, Stonehenge sure. Salberry Hill, and... Pyramids, both Egyptian and Mayan, um, North American Indian mounds. So you bring instruments to these locations, and what is it that you find? Uh, what I find is that in particular places and also at particular times of day, mm -hmm. it becomes clear that over and over again, the ancient builders of these structures primarily chose the types of geology, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, places where the geology naturally concentrated the normal electromagnetic fluctuations that take place on the Earth every day, mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. But they're more concentrated and stronger in some places. And over and over again, those are the spots where the ancient builders chose to place these structures. One that's lesser known, which is mm -hmm. these rock chambers or dolmens, as they're technically called, mm -hmm. they exist from England to Italy, but also throughout the northeastern U.S. as well, uh -huh. and were built over a 3,000-year period. So they're clearly not a cultural phenomenon. They've been built by many different cultures in many different places. The roof, though, is usually flat stone slabs, often very magnetic rock. And what I've confirmed is it does stratify the air in here electrically. Uh -huh. the, there'll be negative air towards the top, positive air towards the bottom, and pulses taking place. You're saying the land underneath that whole area is conducting high electrical magnetic charge. Well, let me show you exactly. This particular one, which is in Mount Ninnam Park in uh, New York State, is located on a mountain that has high magnetic readings. And it's in an intersection of two zones on this mountain. Everything to my left and downhill here has got a much lower but very stable magnetic reading. As soon as you get uphill to my right from this spot, the readings start to rise dramatically, and you start to get a lot of change. This is actually one of the more modest chambers. Uh, it's not too high, you gotta crouch in here. Uh, but this is a particularly energetic chamber. In fact, uh, a photo taken by one of my colleagues on infrared film, uh, there was nothing visible to the naked eye, but when the infrared film was developed, it showed a floating ball of energy right about here, where my right hand is just suspended in midair, with tentacles almost uh, emerging from it. It, lo it looks highly electrical. Wherever you have a site where mm -hmm. ground that is poorly conductive means yeah. ground that's strongly conductive, at that intersection, you have these magnification of all these effects that I'm talking about. And those kind of intersections are where these ancient monuments have been sited for 5,000 years. Well, this is some of the work around crop circles in England where these two different um, types of soil or earth come together. Well, all I can tell you is that when I worked there with um, Avebury, uh, Silbury Hill, and Windmill Hill, uh -huh. three of the oldest and largest megalithic structures in Europe, uh -huh. uh, they are very close to one another. Uh, they clearly match up with the geology of this type. Uh -huh. And when I was there working on it, you could see these crop circles all over the place. What I'm fascinated with is something in the human physiology that can detect these electromagnetic currents. Sure. What is it Sometimes. about our physiology? The, the, the simple law in, or principle in physics is called induction, mm -hmm. and it's actually the way our um, electrical power plants work. Mm -hmm. Anytime you have a changing magnetic field, uh -huh. that will generate an electric current in anything present that's capable of conducting electricity. Right. Now, that includes the ground, and we have ground currents that run through the Earth every day. That's a standard part of geophysics. Mm -hmm. But our brains are obviously very good conductors of electricity, and so naturally we're going to also have electrical currents generated in our own brain. I had an interesting experience out in um, Petroglyph National Park, northwest of Albuquerque. 
It's the biggest one of these continuity discontinuities in the United States. Yeah. So the geology is the most dramatic there for these energies. And it's Petroglyph Park because it's the biggest concentration of rock art. Uh, and during the course of a day, I stumbled into a surge of energy that was clearly being emitted from the rocks. There was clearly an electrical ground current in the rock there that ionized the air around it. And it began to just rise very dramatically at one point late in the afternoon. Uh, to, and I followed it as it spread throughout this ridge. It was very intriguing. And when I mentioned it to the, the uh, park ranger in the visitor center, she said, you know, a lot of people come here and they go say, tell me, I always like to go up into the rocks and feel the energies. And yeah. she said, I've been dismissing them as a bunch of new age crazies, uh -huh. but you're telling me there may be something to that. And so I told her about 2% of today's population, uh -huh. the University of Munich and others have done very good studies demonstrating that a small percentage of even contemporary humans can just sense uh, very small disturbances in the electrical or magnetic fields. Probably if we were living in nature, we have more of that sensitivity. I think so, because normally we're surrounded by permanent magnets in the form of steel beams and the cars that we get into. Right. We're certainly surrounded by all sorts of electrical forces, and that's got to make us less sensitive than, say, uh -huh. an ancient shaman thousands of years ago who spent most of his time outside. Basically, you're saying the land underneath that whole area is conducting high electrical magnetic charge. Well, and here what we're talking about is uh, three different levels of chalk aquifer that do slant up and hit the surface of the ground here. Chalk aquifer means there's uh, the soil is made of chalk, and underneath that there's water or on exactly okay. or within the uh, pores of the chalk there's water. Oh, okay. okay. And what's important about that is that when water percolates through mm -hmm. porous rock, that alone creates electrical charge. Oh. So that's another effect oh. that I haven't mentioned until now, oh. which is really dominant in places like England that have a lot more limestone and chalk than they do, say, magnetic rock. Oh, I see. So that could be an explanation why there's more of these mounds and, and also crop circles appearing there. Well, there is a lot more, yes, of this, of this earth energy of an electrical nature, really, not so much magnetic. And you found that if an ancient culture placed a seed inside yeah. one of these um, mounds or sacred circles, they would increase their food production. How would that work? Uh, it, well, it, there are um, electrical forces that can be good for the growth of seeds. Yeah. And what one question I asked myself was, why did these ancient peoples go to such almost absurd extremes mm -hmm. to invest so much effort and energy into building these structures? When because I, you're talking about a small population that's agricultural, right. and yet they put thousands of manpower hours right. into building these hills. Now you take Silbury Hill, right. uh, the largest mound in Europe. Mm -hmm. Uh, 14 million man hours, yet the population of the area is estimated to have been less than 4,000 people at the wow. time. And it, on, in fact, the area had already been abandoned because of poor soil, uh -huh. exhausted soil, poor farming material in the days before uh, the existence of fertilizer or crop rotation or not. Right. A, this small band of people moves back into this exhausted soil. Yeah. Uh, they're obviously scraping to get by as subsistence farmers, yeah. and they spend 14 million man hours building this mound. I wanted to know why. That seems like a sure recipe for suicide. How could they have known that that was going to work? I have to guess that it came from uh, some form of original trial and error based uh -huh. on observation over hundreds of years. Because yeah. even Silbury Hill, which was put up 500 years before the Egyptian pyramids, that was already oh, 500 years younger than Windmill Hill Causeway Enclosure, which is next door to it. Now, that was circular ditches. Uh, archaeologists have found wheat seeds that were brought there and placed in shallow pits in the mm -hmm. ground, right where the energy would have been concentrated. And they weren't seeds that simply fell in from a field. They were seeds that were carefully cleaned first. Any trace of uh, weed seed was, was removed. Somebody took a lot of trouble to take this somewhat valuable seed and process seed, bring it there, and deposit it right in a spot that would have concentrated the same kind of energies that improved the growth. The, the substance of the force, the electromagnetic force that comes through there, what does it actually do to a seed to make it more productive? What we know the modern laboratory controlled versions do is to actually generate a physiological response inside the cell that makes the seed uh, more 
uh, tolerant to the stress of free radicals? Because free radicals age the body, and exactly. if we have free radical protection, we can maintain a sort of vitality. Right, and the exact same thing is true on a more accelerated time frame in a plant that only lasts one year. So anything that does help fight off those will enable a more vigorous plant to grow and to produce uh, more food. We take it for granted, at least here today, that we'll easily have enough food to survive. These were subsistence agricultural uh, civilizations before the effects of crop rotation and fertilizer were discovered around 1000 mm -hmm. BC. Once those were discovered, Stonehenge was abandoned. People stopped coming. And that was true in these other sites, which other uh, continents and areas that discovered uh, crop rotation and discovered fertilizer at different periods. Once they did find that, they didn't have to go to these great efforts. So Stonehenge was abandoned because... It uh, well, it was abandoned at the same time that, agri that agriculture in England began using fertilizer and crop rotation, and that's an awful lot of coincidence in my book. So your explanation would be that it was no longer needed to exactly. increase productivity, and also the Druidic societies around there were also dying out due to influx of other Actually, the, that's a misunderstanding. Oh, really? The Druids weren't even in England at the time. No, Stonehenge and, was abandoned. And who were the people that built it? No, well, they're called the Beaker people based on the the fact that they liked to drink beer and were buried with their vessels, and that's about all anybody knows about them. But I'm sure healing also was um, amplified in these kind of sites, these kind of megalithic sites. I, we don't know about that. What, what is kind of interesting is, my, is the folklore from the last few hundred years surrounding mm -hmm. places like uh, Stonehenge and Avebury does stress healing and pregnancy as reasons to visit the site. And also there's an atmospheric components I haven't talked oh, yeah, about. They're less important probably, but they are known pulses that penetrate from the ionosphere that, mm -hmm. that sort of shake the Earth's magnetic field lines, sometimes very dramatically so for a small area. Mm -hmm and they take place in the wee hours of the morning. Uh -huh. And uh, there, there's a phenomenon known to psychologists as the 3 a.m. wow, uh -huh. uh, which is that time when you wake up in the middle of the night, you don't know why, you can't quite go back to sleep, yeah. but suddenly a solution pops into your mind to some problem that you've been struggling with. Yeah, that happens, <laughs> yes. Well, and then you grab for a piece of paper and you write it down, and. But what are they saying it's about? Um, well, no one is saying anything on, in that regard as far as I know. But I, I find it interesting that that's the same time frame uh, in, during the course of a day in which all these energy fluctuations that I'm talking about are maximized. Uh -huh. And so perhaps there's a connection. That's a right. guess on my part. Well, have you yourself, can, can you talk about any experiences you've had at these areas? No, I'm a real slug. I, uh, <laughs> I've been to all these areas, and people ask me, what kind of special experiences did you have? And I've had none. I'm usually, though, bent over a meter in, uh, with a flashlight in a very, very different mindset. Uh-huh. So, so you don't I, feel anything. You're no, just... um, I really don't. Yet I've had mysterious things like batteries fail in my mm -hmm. uh, camera, which when I took them away from the ancient site, mm -hmm. functioned perfectly again, bring them back, they failed again. I've had others working with me who've had that same experience. Well, one, the first time I did go out in and out of one of these rock chambers, one of these dolmens, repeatedly crossing magnetic field lines uh, during the course of a day, I actually feared for my life by the end of that day. I felt like I was going to have a heart attack. Because uh, some electromagnetic current within your body wasn't adjusting to all these different fields? Well, I just have to guess that maybe what was happening was the electric currents being generated in my body at random intervals wasn't the best thing for my heart, perhaps. I so you know. did feel something? Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> You're not such a slug. <laughs> well, I had no, uh, no uplifting experiences. But I've been, frankly, quite uplifted mm -hmm. by realizing that uh, we're effectively in a dance, in an electromagnetic dance with our home planet every day whether we realize it or not. And realizing it is, is a thrill for me, and I think it would be a thrill for a lot of people to realize that this is something that's happening with all of us all the time. I'm talking to John Burke, geophysical investigator. We've been talking about the mounds around Europe and the Americas, and you're saying, John, that there's a whole bunch of megalithic sites in this country that have been built for various reasons. That's part of a whole uh, 
system of mound building that built thousands of mounds throughout the middle part of our country, all up through the Mississippi River and its tributaries. So these mounds are like hills that are hollow inside, right? No, they're not hollow. They're mm -hmm. solid man-made mounds, though, okay. that were erected by simply people carrying basket loads of earth up and dumping them. And we're talking the tune of 20, 30 million man hours in some of these cases. They're huge, these mounds. Yes, some of them. The biggest one in Cahokia, Illinois, rivals the Great Pyramid in Giza in terms of volume. Now, one of the most intriguing ones mm -hmm. is the Serpent Mound. That's very right. well known. And its geology is particularly dramatic in all these regards. Mm -hmm. We took uh, instruments and seeds there twice and find there are in interesting forces at work there. Produced minor improvements in the seed uh, one of the times we took them. But a the second time we took them, there was a thunderstorm in the area. Mm -hmm. And that produced dramatically altered magnetic fields and electric ground currents in the area where the seeds were placed on the ground. These shamans or sensitives in these ancient cultures followed the Earth's energy and created the serpent mounds around the uh, movement of these energies? Actually, that serpent mound, the whole site it's placed on is a very narrow bluff, and that whole bluff is, is very uh, powerful in regards to uh, magnetic alterations, and it's in the perfect location to maximize electrical currents, although I, those weren't measured. And I did measure electric charge in the air there. That was unusual. Let's, let's talk about Ganjiwam, yeah. because Ganjiwam, is, what I've heard, is a place where people have uh, incredible emotional experiences. Yes, uh, Ganjiwam, which is in southeastern Connecticut, it's mm -hmm. a swamp, but it's mm -hmm. preserved, is a good example of what you were talking about before. How did people know? How did people know that these forces That's were right. present? Today, they started realizing that there's something funny going on there when they would take tours of people in the mm -hmm. Gunjiwamp Society. And at the foot of this one cliff, they came to name the Cliff of Tears. Mm -hmm. People would simply break down hysterically, crying and sobbing. Men would burst into nosebleeds, and a number of women started menstruating spontaneously. Wow. Uh, they took me up there, this, that group, and um, they never even told me which one was the cliff. They were very shrewd about it. They uh -huh. just sort of said, there's some interesting stuff around here. And I followed my instrument up, and running through the face of that cliff is a six-inch band of magnetic ore, uh -huh. which gave the strongest readings I've ever found in a natural setting. And so it was right at that point. And that's, so that magnetic strip will trigger some emotions or physiological changes in the body? Apparently it did to a percentage of people, and they were fairly dramatic. And you didn't have anything? Else. No, I haven't slept out there. Uh, I haven't had the courage to try that. And um, I feel there's a lot of other people who are probably more sensitive in that regard. My job is to be the one guy who comes in with instruments and looks objectively at all of this. Well, thank you for joining us. I mean, my feeling is that there have been people throughout human civilization that have developed their sensitivity and understood from what you're saying the, the true nature of Earth energies and have been able to tune their human instrument not only to have spiritual experiences but to have uh, increase in crop pr productivity and to create societies around these special electromagnetic currents in the Earth. When you think of it today, the biggest structures that we modern people build are probably hydroelectric dams. Right. And why do we build them? We build them because they're worth the effort, because they produce electricity, which is the lifeblood of an industrial civilization. In this case, we're talking about structures that were built requiring enormous effort that produced fertility, mm. which is the lifeblood of an agricultural civilization. So looked at that way, they weren't any different than we are. They were just a different set of people working with a different knowledge base and a different set of tools to solve the same problems.